One, two, one, two.
Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to St. Mary's Parish Church in Motherwell to this day, which is a day in which we have a dedication service for the members of our guild. Wherever you may be, and whatever your circumstances, we make you very welcome. Let us continue our worship with the call to worship. What does the Lord your God ask of you? Only this, to fear the Lord your God, to conform to all his ways, to love him and to serve him with all your heart and soul. Amen. Our opening praise, hymn 172, Sing for God's Glory.
It is good to give thanks to the Lord, for His love endures forever. Let us pray. To you, the Lord of life, we come, offering our thanks and praise for all that you are to us, the one who is the light of the world, who has the healing touch, who guides our steps, who is there in the times of doubt and fear, just as you are there in the times of joy and confidence. You are the one who makes us one in your love, and so we offer our thanks and praise. To you, the Lord of life, we come, acknowledging that all too often we fail you and fail others. The times when we are too busy to make time for you. The times when we blame you because life has taken us to places we do not wish to be. The times when we have neglected others, especially the ones who are most important to us and for whom we have a measure of responsibility, our families, our friends, and the people we know who require our help and our concern. Forgive us, we pray, Heavenly Father, and help us to once more walk in the way of the one who is the light of the world and the Lord of life, even Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray as one family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a little bit concerning the church news. Um, The intimations are there for you, and we commend them all to you. Uh, I've highlighted the services that we're having at the Avondale Care Home, and if you would care to come and help, that would be very nice indeed. You would enjoy it. The folks enjoy meeting up with our team. And a reminder also that The board meeting scheduled for the 11th of October is going to take place on the same night as the session meeting scheduled for Wednesday the 8th of November and will commence at 7 p.m. So everything there I commend to you. I brought a few things along today because I was thinking about, I was thinking about how things change an awful lot. And one of the things that have changed is taking photographs. Now, how many of you are good at taking photographs? Uh, Mr. Joyce, are you not good at taking photographs? Put your hand up. I, I know that you're good at taking photographs. Well, How many of you take your photographs on your mobile phone? Yes? Mm -hmm. What about that photograph? Do you like that one? What's that? Can you see that one? (laughs) What's that? Oh, can I get one of those? Oh, very nice. Thank you. You all got right. Okay. I know you can't see it. Yeah. Right. Right. It's a photograph of the coronation coach. Right. That's, that's me name dropping again. You know, I was there and I took this photograph. So lots of us take, we take our photographs on our phones nowadays. We used to take photographs with a camera. I'm sure Mr. Joyce still uses his camera to take photographs. So I went looking for some old 
older type of photographs. And this is, these are some photographs that I took 30 years ago. And it's all right, Mrs. Thompson, you're not in any of them, so don't worry. Right. I don't think you would like to be in this hospital, would you? Would you like to be in that hospital? Doesn't look very nice, does it? No, no, everybody's saying no. I'm walking up here to show. No. I don't think you would like to be. If anybody wants to see it, come through to the coffee afterwards and you can have a look. This is a hospital in a country called Romania. And I took this photograph 30 years ago. And there was a whole, whole lot of photographs. It doesn't look a very nice place. And in those days, it wasn't a very nice place at all. Because they just had a revolution. And they had, everybody had got fed up with the dictator and they got rid of him, but they had nothing. So lots of us went out to help them. And I took photographs to show everybody back home just how awful it was. So we take photographs on our phones, we take them with a camera. So that was about 30 years ago. And I've got here a photograph from about, oh, 60 years ago. Right. This is in black and white. There. Okay. Uh, th those of you who are on the, the cleaning team here, this is the cleaning team for my church, my father's church in Irvine 60 years ago. Uh, I recognize some of them, especially Mrs. Dunlop. Uh, she, was, she was the Ian Beatty of our church. And as you can see, she's right in the middle with her apron on, in charge of everything. So we had photos in black and white. So this is 60 years ago. And finally, I found these two photographs. These are 100 years old, right? right? Marlene knows who they are. Sorry? Sorry? You still look the same. I know, because that, that, that's my grandfather. <laughs> and that's my granny, right? That's my, those are my English grandparents. Again, I'll put them through there so you can see them. So everything has changed. A hundred years ago, the photographs were this sort of brown color and things got better and better. Yeah. That's my grandpa, yeah. Ganka. Ganka. You've got it in one. And that's my granny. Can you say granny? That would be your sort of great, 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 great granny a million times away. The reason I brought these along to show because it, I think, tells us how things have changed. The clothes that the people were wearing, what my granny and grandpa were wearing 100 years ago, different from what we wear. Hopefully, the places in Romania, they've now got better. The, the hospitals are much better now. It's changed. It's got better. Most of us take our photographs now using our phones and not cameras. Things change. But one thing that never changes, one person who never changes, is Jesus. And a long time ago, a very famous person writing in the Bible said that Jesus was the same today, tomorrow, and forever. And that's an important thing for us to remember, that no matter what is happening, God will be there. He doesn't change. He will always love us. He will always care for us. He will look out for us. He will help us. He's not just the God for us. He's the God of everything and everybody.
So we've got a song, a hymn that we're going to sing now. And we think it might be, well, we think that it might be slightly new to some of you. It's hymn 174, and it's all about who God is. God of great and God of small, hymn 174. We come now to the part of the service where we read God's Word. Margaret Carroll is going to read the lessons for us today. We will sing through hymn 247, uh, starting in a moment. Uh, we remain seated as we sing verse 1 and then verse 2. We will stand for the last verse. The readings are from Luke's Gospel and from Luke's second book, the book of Acts. So we sing the first verse, moved by the gospel, let us move with every gift and art.
first readings are from Luke chapter 2, 36 to 38. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow at the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their resources. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Sorry, tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. Reading from Acts 18, 18 to 21, going on to verse 24 to 28. After staying in Corinth for a considerable time, Paul said farewell to the believers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. At Senkie, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there. But first he himself went into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, he declined. But in taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. Now there came to Ephesus a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wished to cross over to Achaia, The believers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. On his arrival, he greatly helped those who, through grace, had become believers, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. Amen. May God has his blessings to these readings from his holy word. Could we stand and sing verse 3?
the text this morning from the book of Proverbs at chapter 30. A woman who reverences the Lord is to be praised. I've entitled this slightly tongue-in-cheek, perhaps, Behind Every Great Man, for is an even greater woman. The last time Arthur preached, he started with a spoof letter from a consultancy firm to a certain carpenter in Nazareth concerning his choice of associates. This time, I would like to start by reading out a part of a real letter from a renowned evangelist based at the time in Corinth, writing to a group of colleagues in the great city of Rome. And this is what Paul says. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church at St. Cray, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila who work with me in Christ Jesus and who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my relative Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and greet his mother, a mother also to me. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. In this, the concluding section of his letter, Paul first of, commend, first of all commends Phoebe, who is obviously en route from St. Crea, which is the port of Corinth, to Rome. And it's most likely it would be Phoebe who took the letter. We'll come back to her in just a moment, but it's important to remember that. In these 16 verses, eight women are named. Some of them are very significant, perhaps closely related to or holding high positions in the royal family. Some we know very little about, most we know nothing about, and a few, like some of the men, were most likely slaves. So here we have a very mixed bag of people, <clears throat> all of them apart from Freebie, at the heart of the Christian community in Rome, the capital of the mighty Roman Empire. So there's eight, eight women either named or mentioned. Some of these women were held in high esteem because of positions that they had within the Christian community. Some were praised because of their untiring efforts as followers of Jesus. Amongst them, a deacon, an apostle, a pastor, a set of twins. A woman who reverences the Lord is to be praised. So we start with Phoebe, Phoebe the deacon. It's very 
true to say and very sad to say that as men started to dominate the church, Phoebe had been reduced to the status of servant. It's been argued that she didn't hold the official position of deacon, but what we later termed a deaconess. The word deacon can also in Greek mean a handmaid or a servant. But Paul uses a very specific noun, diakonon, to describe her. The very same word that he uses to describe himself and his own office. These early deacons assisted in serving at the supper, at communion, as well as preaching and looking after the less fortunate members of the Christian community. There's also a Hebrew word, shamash, the person who directs and leads public worship. And there's a translation of the Bible called the Complete Jewish Bible. And it says that Phoebe was the shamash of the congregation at St. Cree. So the scholars can nitpick to their heart's delight about Phoebe's status, but certain things are clear. Her name in Hebrew means pure. Her name in Greek means bright and prophet. Her name in biblical terms also means shining. Paul calls her a diakonon, the same term he uses of himself. And very significantly, it would seem that it was to Phoebe that Paul entrusted his letter to the Christians in Rome. Behind every great man. So here is a dedicated, trusted, and obviously highly regarded woman. A woman who reverences the Lord and is to be praised. Phoebe the deacon. The next person we should look at is Junia, Junia the Apostle. And once again, surprise, surprise, we find some controversy. There are those who say that there's actually a misplaced accent mark in Romans chapter 16 and verse 7 that means that Junia should be Junias. How very handy indeed to make her into a male. But the argument doesn't stack up. The word apostle means one who is sent, akin to missionaries. And so those negative commentators argue that Junia and Andronicus were not apostles with a capital A in the proper sense. They contend that Paul merely meant that Junia and Andronicus were missionaries sent out to minister in a general sense. It didn't mean that they were apostles in the proper sense. But significantly, Paul mentions them by name. And the only other apostles whom he names are the twelve, himself, Barnabas, Silvanus, and Timothy. And all of them were recognized as ordained clergy in the apostolic line of succession by the later church. It's very clear that Paul intends to communicate that Junia and Andronicus are apostles because he mentions them by name. The early church fathers too, like Origen, agreed that the name is Junia. And one of the oldest complete copies of the Bible, the Codex Sinaiticus in the third century, it does as well. And St. John Chrysostom, his name means the one with the golden tongue. He was one of the greatest preachers amongst the early fathers. He said this, to be an apostle is something great, but to be outstanding among the apostles, just think what a wonderful song of praise that is. They were outstanding on the basis of their works and virtuous actions. Indeed, how great is the wisdom of this woman that she was even deemed worthy of the title of apostle. Today, I think we're also entitled to say of the guild that they are outstanding. Outstanding on the basis of their works, and their virtuous actions. A woman who reverences the Lord is to be praised. And so we arrive at Prisca or Priscilla, as she's also known. 
Priscilla was actually my grandmother's name. You might want to know, or you might not want to know, that Priscilla means ancient, or perhaps more kindly, longevity, or perhaps best of all, venerable. Priscilla, the pastor. And believe it or not, there have been those who have argued that she shouldn't be called a pastor, because what she and her husband ran in their home was a kind of Bible study, not an actual church. Well, once again, the evidence from Paul is clear and unambiguous. He uses the technical term ecclesia, which means the called out assembly or congregation. It's also clear that Paul considers Priscilla and her husband equals in ministry. He calls them fellow workers. What's really interesting is that it is Priscilla and Aquila together who correct the teaching of Apollos and that they're both mentioned together numerous times, usually with Priscilla first. Here is a couple that lies at the very heart of the expanding Christian community, moving around, encountering danger, and significantly so well versed in the doctrine and theology of this new faith that they're entrusted with not just preaching the word, but also explaining it and correcting where necessary. It took us in Scotland until 1928 to ordain a female minister. Her name was Vera Kenmuir, and that was the Congregational Church. Shamefully, it took the Church of Scotland almost 50 years to follow suit. How on earth did we allow this to be so? Almost 2,000 years ago, just a few years after the resurrection, there is to be found the fine example of Priscilla, a pastor and preacher. A woman who reverences the Lord is to be praised. I could have chosen any number of women to end this voyage around the early church. Lydia, the businesswoman who held the church in her house. The sisters, Martha and Mary. Joanna, whose husband was one of Herod's stewards. Mary of Magdala, Susanna. But I've gone for the twins, Tryphena and Tryphosa. We suspect they were twins, they were certainly sisters and obviously very close. Their names mean dainty and delicate, which could suggest that they were perhaps of aristocratic background. But Paul says that they toil in the Lord, and the word he uses implies really hard graft. So we have here either Paul with a smile on his face as he commends dainty and delicate, belying their names and being really hard workers. Or perhaps we have here two ladies with their sleeves rolled up, the sweat on their brows, and these are almost nicknames, dainty and delicate. So don't bring the broken pay packet home to them. Either way, here are two women who are renowned and respected and admired for all the work they put in for the sake of their faith. A woman who reverences the Lord is to be praised. In Paul's greetings, there's to be found a cross-section of the Christian community. People with access to the most powerful in the empire. People in business. People in service to the wealthy. And people who are enslaved. And within that cross-section, the women some of them holding high office, some of them entrusted with important tasks, and some of them happy to work away in the background. It's a cross-section of many an organization and indeed the church, and a cross-section too of the guild. A woman who reverences the Lord is to be praised. Amen. We come now to this part in the service where we have the dedication of our guild. And to begin this part of the service, we're going to sing the words of 
the Guild Hymn. The aim of the Guild. The Church of Scotland Guild is a movement within the Church of Scotland which invites and encourages both women and men to commit their lives to Jesus Christ and enables them to express their faith in worship, prayer, and action. The motto of the Guild, whose we are and whom we serve. To the members of our guild, you're a very special part of the body of Christ, and you should rightly be proud of being members of the guild. In the Church of Scotland, we often acknowledge the vital role that the guild plays in the life of the church. You provide fellowship and friendship to so many people. You're tireless in your good works, your outreach into the community where your help, whether practical or spiritual, makes such a difference to the lives of so many. The fellowship you share within the local churches and communities is important, especially just now, when so many challenges lie before the church and so much anxiety is being experienced. Hold fast to your faith do all you can to help others, support one another, and never be afraid to proclaim the gospel through worship, prayer, and action.
to the members of the guild, if you are able, I invite you please to stand. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have shown yourself to be faithful and true at all times. And through your son, Jesus Christ, we have been shown the way in which to live our lives in true and faithful fashion. We give you our thanks for the guild and especially our guild here. As we thank you for all that the guild has done in the past, so we ask your blessing upon all the members as they address the needs and challenges that lie ahead. <coughs> Give to each and all faith, wisdom in the decisions that they have to make, perseverance in the tasks they undertake, compassion in their dealings with each other and with people, generosity in their outreach, and love for everyone regardless of circumstance. Grant unto our guild your blessing, we pray, Heavenly Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite everyone now to stand, if you can, as we sing the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. Please be seated. Thank you. The offering will now be received for dedication. Let us pray. We bring these gifts to you, Heavenly Father, that you might bless them and us to your glory, that everything that we do might be for the building of your kingdom, the caring of your people, the proclamation of the gospel. Amen. Margaret's going to lead us in our intercessions but I, just beforehand, I need to say to you that um, very unfortunately, very sadly, 
Miss Christina Brown passed away on Monday and details of her funeral service are there for you. We held here in the church and thereafter to Holy Town. And I know that there are quite a number of you who remember her. And so we ask you also to remember her niece, Wendy, and others associated with her family and also the wider friendship of church and the guild. Thank you. <coughs> Let us pray. Father God, we come to you again to ask that your healing love will bless those in our world who are in want, in poor health, or distress beyond their ability to cope. In our wonderful planet Earth, help us as individuals, as groups, and as nations to share its abundant resources more fairly. Enable us to reach out to those who need our help whether they are near us or far away. In our own church, we ask for your blessing on those members of our fellowship who are ill or sad at this time. Support Bryce and Helen in their long journey back to health for Bryce. May we look forward in faith at this time of change and reorganization within the Church of Scotland so that what is built by our faltering hands may be strengthened and perfected by your love and guidance. Grant that in the planning of finite resources, we may not lose sight of your infinite love and care. At this special service of dedication for our guild, we ask for your blessing on the president, office bearers, and committee members that they may continue to build Christian fellowship here in our own church and join with the guild movement throughout Scotland in supporting chosen projects for people in need. Help us both in the guild and in the church to open our hearts and minds to your unchanging mission so that we might be the new wineskins that can embrace new ways of working without losing our focus on the new wine of your eternal purpose. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve. Amen. To close our worship, hymn 249, we have heard a joyful sound. And before we start to sing it, something you might not have noticed or realized, but other than the leaving song, everything that we have sung today was written by a woman. We have heard a joyful sound.
My friends in Christ, I place you into God's loving care, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you now and always. Thank you.